Hey there, welcome to the Pseudo Show. This is Brandon. No housekeeping today. In this episode, Bill, Neil, and I get together to finish our conversation around the Linux desktop and the application landscape. So let's so let's just dive right in. So here is Linux desktop app landscape. This episode is brought to you by Linode, now called Akamai Connected Cloud, a massively distributed cloud and edge platform. Sign up today at linode.com slash tux to get a $100 credit and start deploying your workloads where your users are. While you're at it, use that credit and spin up a Linode virtual machine or their Kubernetes platform and deploy the pseudo show application of the month only office workspaces. At Tux Digital and the Pseudo Show, we love Linode because it's easy to deploy virtual machines to test and roll out new applications like only office workspaces. De deploy a Linode virtual machine or their Kubernetes platform and take advantage of Linode's affordable object storage as the backend to your hosted only office workspace instance. And let us know in the Tux Digital forums how it went. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show. Continuing on from our previous episode, episode 61, never the year of the Linux desktop, the Linux application landscape and how it's evolved and how it's had an impact on, on that exact, on that, on that title, never the year of the Linux desktop. Cause I personally think that it hasn't been the lack of availability of commercial applications. That's definitely had an impact, but why didn't those applications get there in the first place? Neil and I were talking about this. We've talked about this a lot. I think it has a lot to do with the history of developing on the Linux desktop. What was previously the problems of the past, or maybe not necessarily problems, but the sins of the past, usually through shaming developers for using a specific programming language or just poor documentation as or today obscure languages that no one knows about or and again not well documented for example i'll take it back this one is fairly well documented from my point of view but it but it's obscure and that's vala unless you're a gtk developer for the gnome desktop or or related systems, it's, you probably have never heard of Vala. There's a lot of introductions with uh, newer languages, newer lower level languages such as Rust, but also a lot of Linux application development happens in C still to this day. But Brandon, Gnome, you can use JavaScript. I really don't want to program a desktop application in JavaScript. I might as well just do it in Electron from my point of view there. All right. You know what? Let, before we go further into the, the weird things about this, I think we can just sum this up by saying, for some unknown reason, Linux applications developers like pain. They're masochists. They prefer programming languages. Actually, I'll go, I'll go broader and say, in general, Linux application developers seem to prefer more painful programming languages than their counterparts in other operating systems. If you look at MacOS, the trend has actually been towards moving to higher level abstractions, higher level simplified APIs, the whole work. So you've got things like moving from C to C++ with Carbon and systems, the MacOS system, classic MacOS APIs, and then decarbonizing for Mac OS X, and then to Objective-C and Cocoa, again, coming from Next into Mac OS X. And then today we have Swift with Swift UI, and it is a game changer for application developers. 
So developer productivity and developer simplicity are cornerstones of, of that. On the Windows side of the fence, and this is something that I, I actually personally have some experience with because I, I used to dabble in Windows application development. Like, yes, it started in C like everything else because, again, 80s. And, but they very quickly progressed into C++. And there was a very, very big focus by Microsoft to, to make developer productivity a cornerstone of application development. The concept of rapid application development was something that they pioneered. Well, I don't know if they pioneered. I think I would, we could probably argue that Borland did that first with the with Delphi and all that other stuff. But like Microsoft definitely cemented the concept throughout Windows development and every sex, subsequent implementation of the programming environment as they evolved into .NET and XAML and all this other stuff that they did later, new programming languages in the works. Again, it's that shift upwards to higher level abstractions, simplified programming models, and and providing a, an easy path towards developing good applications and reliable applications. In the Linux world, we've actually regressed for the most part. Or if, if we haven't necessarily regressed, we've never really moved the needle towards that simplified experience. I would argue probably, like even though Val is a weird language that nobody uses, the elementary folks, I think, have necessarily recognized that this is a problem. And they've comp built comprehensive documentation uh, and, and references and examples to like provide this kind of experience. And the KDE folks are doing similar things around how you use their KDevelop environment, providing the Kirigami framework and things like that. But overall, in the, in the application development space, the trend is in the opposite direction yeah. for Linux. It's Instead all of much the, lower level. It's moving towards lower level languages. Like the fact that Rust, you're writing stuff in Rust for, for GTK applications. Rust is probably a fine language. But it's also designed as a systems language. It also makes you care a lot more about all the things you don't need to care about as a high-level application developer. Again, this comes back to the statement I said kind of jokingly. It's like, apparently Linux developers like pain. And this is, this is a very weird trend that makes it difficult for Linux desktop application development, from my view, and I think Brandon would concur with me, to be like actually successful. Now, that being said... It's not like the high-level language stuff is totally dead in the Linux desktop space. A in lot some of cases, it's making a comeback. Right. Like So, yeah. for example, lots of applications are written in Python. Python's a high-level language stack. It's not compiled. It is interpreted. But it is a high-level language, and there are bindings for all kinds of toolkits. People write great applications using GTK, Qt, and who knows what else using Python. And that's great. There's also C Sharp has been making a comeback lately, which I'm actually super pleased about because it's a really nice step forward for the C family of languages. And, and again, when during the time where I dabbled as a Windows application developer, C Sharp was brand new. And it was, it was a godsend for anybody who was doing application development back then. Doing C++ stuff with COM and OLE and all this other stuff, and then moving to this .NET managed runtime environment with simplified interfaces and, and 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 programming models that that basically centered well and more naturally on graphical application invented models and things like that it was a godsend and being able to prototype and rapidly develop applications was a cornerstone of this and we're seeing this actually like a little bit return in the linux space with c sharp uh, i think recently there was a gnome circle app Tube converter. It's a, like a YouTube downloader app or something like that. It converted to C Sharp. They wrote their own binding for for the GNOME library stack themselves. Um, if I recall correctly, let's take a look here. Yeah. So they wrote their own binding for GNOME. They wrote their own binding for, and then they had their binding for Windows using WinUI. Uh, and and they just it's a it's a YouTube downloader front end, and it like does a good job of being that. That's great. Um, we need to see more of those kinds of things. We need to see that that pattern of rising up to being simpler and easier to make application developers more successful. Uh, there, in the past, we had a lot of these kinds of things. I think uh, I want to say Tomboy and Banshee. A lot of GNOME applications in the two, probably two six. 
very early 2.6, so this is 2004, a lot of the applications, the core, what were considered core applications to GNOME were using Mono, which is an open source implementation of .NET, so you can build C With Sharp. GTK bindings. Yeah, yeah. Just, with Mono GTK specifically. So you could use C Sharp to build your apps in, for GNOME. And that that's actually where my, uh, my comment came from. People back then, a lot of people took issue with applications being written in C Sharp. Oh, only took issue. Wow, that, that's an understatement if I've ever heard one. Yeah. Brandon, you should probably explain the context of this because, you know, yeah. most I, people that are listening to this might not have even been around in this space during that time like you and I that's were. true. So in, just the history is in 2006, Novell and Microsoft signed a, an agreement which uh, essentially uh, made it so that Microsoft Microsoft wouldn't sue Novell due to patent violations without any evidence that there were or not. Novell at the time was the principal, you know, they were the owners of Mono. They were the major, most of the developers working on Mono were employed by Novell. And as a result, a lot of the open source community, they did not like what the way things were worded or they didn't like the way things the way anything around this was approached. So uh, everyone went and said, well, I'm not going to use this application anymore just because, just simply because of the language it was written in, not, not because it was technically inferior to other applications. In fact, a lot of the applications, for example, Tomboy was a note-taking application for GNOME, very heavily integrated into the GNOME desktop and into the Evolution data server, if my memory is correct. So there was a lot of great ways to sync your notes across your, your devices. It was immediately, someone em took, took the time to re-implement that application in C. It never got to feature parity. It was never, the, never as good as Tomboy, at least from my point of view. But it was a simple note-taking application, but synchronization features and the integration into the desktop. I don't remember it ever getting to that point. I don't use either of them anymore. I don't even know if they're still in a de active development. The, my point is, is it a lot of C sharp developers that were getting into the Linux desktop ultimately abandoned it. Even some of the core original core GNOME developers left the open source community because of this backlash against C sharp. So big bit of history. I don't want to go into all of it. This is pretty well documented and on several outlets that you can Google search on, but that was the, that in a nutshell, uh, that backlash, how that backlash played out. So we ha ended up with a lot of abandonware such as Banshee, which was a music player for the GNOME desktop, which was one of the best music players for the Linux desktop, maybe even for any platform, period. I'll still take XMMS any day. <laughs> hey, I was, hey, any WinApp clone is a win, but, <laughs> but Banshee made Banshee really, really good for Linux is that it would sync to an iPod. I actually believe they even got Zune support. And, and then FSpot, another a C Sharp application for, for GNOME, that was photo management, a photo management solution that was ultimately replaced by Shotwell. But I still think that FSpot was, at least for the feature set when it was developed at that time, was a better application in terms of its user friendliness, et cetera. I don't think anyone cares anymore about, about what language you write your application in. At least I hope they don't. Uh, Just don't write it in assembler. <laughs> oh, for you, Neil, only assembler. I'll only send oh, it. Oh, God. Assembly. So, but a lot of my new, a lot of really good applications are being developed. Grant their GT. These ones are GTK. I actually, I really like these ones. 
De Niro originally was just called Money, and that one it was written, I believe it was originally written in Python. I have to go back and double check. Actually, it might have been written in Rust originally, and they decided to move it to C Sharp so they could make it a cross plat more easily make it a cross platform application. And then, of course, there's about uh, several others that are. Neil brought up Tube Converter. There's Pinta, which is the GTK equivalent of like Krita or Corel Draw. So I'm happy to see that C sharp development in Linux in Linux isn't dead. But I do think I really do think my original what part of the thesis we wanted to get to is that because it's harder, because it's not documented, that that's the re that's more the reason why, especially in 2006, why, or it, it probably 2001 to 2006, that time frame, is that documentation was poor or was preferred to write in lower level languages like C or even C++. And when it's just simply easier for app commercial application shops to develop in C sharp because they have the talent. Now we get into JavaScript, which for today, you know, in today's Linux world, I really do think the reason why JavaScript is the preferred is the maybe not preferred, but the most prolific language for, for Linux applications today is simply because, so if I'm, um, a commercial application developer. Let's just set, uh, I'll throw one out there randomly. Let's just say Slack. It's easy. So I write it once and it runs on Windows, Mac, and, and Linux. Really, frankly, I can, at one point, I could do the same thing with, with a mono. Sadly, that's not as, uh, but it's not as documented. If I really do think if, in 2006, that there wasn't such a huge backlash to mono, we'd be living in a very different Linux ecosystem. I'd like to get your guys' takes on this as well. So I think the reason why we see JavaScript and Electron actually comes from a completely different reason. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's actually quite rare for consumer applications to be written as Electron apps. Have you wondered why that is? My my theory, there are a few exceptions to this, like Discord is obviously an Electron app, but it's a super custom one. But my theory is, if it's an application where it doesn't matter how much you hate the user experience it's going to get used, they're going to go with Electron. And if it's something that they have to live and die by their user experience, they're not going to do it. So the choice of using a native application rather than an Electron application, occurs more often when it's aimed towards the consumer and far less often when it's aimed at the business because businesses typically don't involve the people using the application in the application selection process. So users don't get a choice is what this comes down to. And when users don't get a choice, there is no reason to invest in a quality user experience. And thus, you get Electron apps. That's why Slack's an Electron app. That's why Skype's an Electron app. That's why, you know, so many of our business applications, like on my work machine, every single application that I have to use for work is in a Chromium window, a Chromium embed, or a custom Chromium build. Wasn't Microsoft Outlook recently rewritten as an Electron app? That's right, it was. As part of the one electron, as the sorry, the one outlook, the one outlook initiative or Project Monarch, as I think it was codenamed, they just punted on the Windows version of Outlook, and they're replacing it with Electron app. I can tell you this is the case because for my work computer, where I'm forced to use Microsoft applications, I upgraded my Outlook to the quote unquote new experience, and let me tell you, it's no better than running Outlook than I would be via doing it the web. It's, That's because it's the same thing. It is, and it feels extremely restrictive and feature-less. But Neil, I want to go back to something you touched on earlier, and that was 
the pace of development in the pace of, oh, how do I want to say this? The pace of evolution of programming in Mac OS and Windows versus Linux. You talked about Apple embracing different types of abstraction along the course of its evolution over the past, we'll call it 23 years. Do you think that's not happening in Linux because of a maybe a comfort level of languages with the developers or a lack of availability and choice or an inability to implement a higher level language? Like what's caught, what's motivating Apple and Microsoft to evolve into more abstracted languages such as Swift versus something a little older like C? It's a great question and you're not going to like the answer. I know what the answer is, but I want to hear you say it anyway. It's because Microsoft and Apple are building for other people to build. And in the Linux world, this is a very rare thing that happens. Usually you're building for yourself. That's not necessarily always a bad thing. You get some very interesting solutions out of it. But if you're trying to build to enable or to build to help others succeed, everything is backwards right now for that. Like the the whole methodology and thought process towards how uh, languages, toolkits, libraries, stacks, all the stuff, have, it's completely the opposite direction of the mindset of what Microsoft and Apple are thinking, which is, well, they can't see into our souls. They can't see our history. They can't see all the things. And also, we're not building everything for everyone. So we got to give everyone the tools to build for the, for everyone else. Um, that just doesn't occur uh, all that often. I'm not going to say it doesn't occur at all, because like if you look at what's going on in KDE Plasma over the past like decade with the frameworks and all that other stuff, the restructure to, to make their platform work and to build it out has been to enable that kind of thing. Now, are they hitting the right notes on that all the time? I don't think so. They, they'll, they'll get better at it over time, but they also have a strong foundation in the fact that Qt is a library that is built in this philosophy. And so they have an example they can work from to build further into that. Gnome's in a more perilous situation because they're building everything for themselves. And that even goes all the way down to the toolkit. And we can see evidence of this being kind of a problem when you can see how other desktops that have traditionally used GTK have been a little upset about the, the changes and the evolution path or the lack of prioritization of other stakeholders in GTK. Now, those other stakeholders are not necessarily right all the time, nor is GNOME right all the time. But the balancing act is clearly not being done here. And that's actually like... One of the things I kind of take away as evidence that like this is the backwards mentality when it comes to application development. Now, there have been also excellent advances in the GNOME side around application development. If you look at, for example, GNOME Builder, which is a which is a project within GNOME to build an IDE. GNOME Builder provides you a very quick path to creating a basic GNOME application, leveraging GNOME technologies and libraries, gives you some level of prototyping and rapid application development feel, which is great. And KDE does the same thing with KDevelop. Do you know what the problem is? None of the commercial Linux distributions offer either of them. I was going to say, I feel like from... Nobody knows who they are. Well, right. So in talking to my colleagues that have dabbled in programming before, especially the younger ones that have come right out of, out of college, the number one thing that they tell me that they crave is an IDE for Linux. And I've said they're out there. They're just not marketed well. But if you look, KDevelop is, is one of those that I hear is an amazing IDE and really could afford to get a lot more love, attention, and spotlight time. Yeah, I would, I would say that both KDevelop and GNOME Builder are both great development environments for their respective platforms. But nobody ships them and nobody talks about them. And that means that you don't, there's no exposure, there's no promotion, there's no, there's nothing to, to enable people to, to recognize that there's a path to do this. And the popular Linux IDEs out there, the popular ones, are Microsoft Visual Studio Code, which I will argue till heat death of the universe that that is not an IDE, it is just a very fancy text editor and, or code editor rather, and the JetBrains IDEs. And there's a notable thing about both of those. 
neither of them can develop graphical applications. We don't have a singularly successful or well-promoted in integrated development environment that helps people build graphical desktop applications. If I were a betting man putting on the on the on, into this into this race, I would probably say a commercial Linux distribution should probably ship Qt Creator because Qt Creator is a generic high-level integrated development environment for building Qt-based applications that will work on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And it gives you a very easy hot path to building rapidly good graphical applications and has support for some languages and has pluggable to add more programming languages in. So as communities develop around it that use other programming languages other than C++ or Python or whatever the standard ones are, it could be fit into there. Or KDevelop is another one, or GNOME Builder. But like having not having that is essentially admitting flat out that you're not really caring about encouraging graphical desktop application development. That, uh, I agree with that to some extent, that, you know, that having an IDE is important. The, to me, though, the big problem is whether if we're talking QT or GTK, the there isn't enough there there isn't a a higher level language that other than Python. I think there are Qt bindings for Python. Yeah, there are. That uh, that a lot of people know. As much as I don't like it, and I C and C plus plus programmers are becoming an endangered species. Uh, to me, it's sad because it's uh, we're losing out on a lot of. We're now we're going to see it, like that again with the with programming languages going to going higher and higher and higher up the stack. We're losing a lot of lower level knowledge as people leave the industry or retire or just simply die. <laughs> You know, as people leave the industry, they, yeah, that knowledge is getting lost at that, or the, in those lower level languages. Yes, there are some very extremely intelligent people under the age of 35 that are learning C, that are learning C and other, and even assembly, and they, you know, to write operating systems. That's what they want to do. But that is not. Uh, being taught. It's not being taught in schools. You basically have to learn it yourself. I, I got lucky because I learned C++ in school. and uh, My class was the last one in college to learn C++. Somewhat disagree with you guys about not lower, langu lower level languages not being taught in schools because my son, who just graduated from college, did take low level programming and did have to take an operating systems class. And he doesn't like it when I bring it up because it's traumatic for him. And I, I kind of get that. And I remember- It was traumatic for me too. I, so, yeah, uh, you and I have discussed this a couple of, on a couple of occasions, <laughs> Neil, uh, about, about your experiences. But I remember my uncle who was a programmer and a C programmer at that telling me, you can have all the C++ you want, you can have all the Python you want, but it's still not teaching you very good disciplined fundamentals of memory management and actual integration and interaction with the hardware. The hardware doesn't lie. And it forces you to be honest with your programming practices. And I, but I do feel like that, at least some concepts of that are still being taught. I just don't know if it's being retained or if they're finding a daily driver use for that sort of thing. Nowadays, I would probably say for the vast majority of graphical applications being developed, especially line of business applications, that level of guarantee is not required. And in fact, this is why line of business applications took to VB6 like fish out of water, like way back in the mid, in the late 90s is because they didn't need to do that. And that's why VB survived into VB.net 
and is part of the .NET runtime today. And C Sharp basically takes those same learned lessons and applies them to the C language family uh, for, for all the other stuff. Because the C Sharp and all the other, other high-level languages, Vala, Java, and, and so on, like the, they're all about making you have to care less about what's going on so you can focus on what you need to do. Because what you need to do is already hard enough as it is. I think that's, uh, think at least understanding it is important. And that's great that, Bill, that your son did get uh, some exposure to it. Um, I currently recruiting, I, I, I just ask it, you know, recruiting out of college, I just kind of ask, oh, what, you know, what did you what languages did you learn in school? It's typically Python or JavaScript. And I'm like, well, in my brain... That still blows my mind because like when I was in college, I learned C, C++, PHP, Java, and Python. Five programming languages. Yeah. Five like their, programming languages. Like all their final projects were like it were basically Node.js web applications. I'm like, okay, this isn't good. That So that maybe it's just the people I've talked to. Maybe it's the schools they went to and their programs. But that's uh, been my experience so far. Uh, my understanding is that from the folks I know at my alma mater, uh, that is also the trend that they've gone towards. Like, uh, it's basically now Python and JavaScript over there too. With maybe like them talking about Java uh, in specific contexts, and then C for operating systems, and that's about it. it. It doesn't surprise me all that much, because to be truthful, you don't need it for yeah. most stuff. You really don't need it. That, that's true. My point is, is I think it, I'm glad that the Linux community is trying to keep that up. I think. I don't think that's the reason why they're trying to keep that. Oh, it's totally an accident yeah. for sure. It, it's probably, yeah, it's, it's more, more, more likely an accident than on purpose, but when, um, but perspective, uh, as a result, since so many applications in, you know, Katie, it's almost all C plus plus Gnome. It's all C if, uh, and now occasionally rest. I'd like to see more Rust just because it, it does seem to be easier. Uh, I don't know about easier, but it is different. I'm seeing applications getting developed faster, but that's, maybe that doesn't necessarily... I think that's more of a general way. honeymoon around yeah. Rust that kind of exists right now. <laughs> yeah. That may be like coming to an end really soon, but like I know that there's been a lot of general developer enthusiasm around Rust because... Uh, nobody likes being hit with memory safety bugs and crap like that. Like that's the whole reason why, you know, Microsoft and Apple have both moved towards higher level languages and stacks because nobody actually wants to spend time on those problems. And it's not worth, and for most people, it's not worth the time dealing with them. Like that's why the .NET technology was invented in the first place was because they wanted to provide a low cost high performance way of not having to deal with those problems. We sort of concluded the previous episode with a call to action, kind of a solution to the problem. Like there's still, there's still a lot of fundamental things that need to change, but in the previous episode, yeah, the call to action and like, I do think is one of the barriers to adoption is management. Now for application development, for desktop application development, I don't want the answer to be just write all your applications in, in JavaScript and Electron. There's got to be a solution to bring in the wider developer community to into the Linux desktop, not just open source enthusiasts, not just people that want to work on GNOME but, or on KDE. Basically try to make that tent bigger commercial applications. I know there's a lot of work in FlatHub to make it so that developers can monetize their apps in Flat FlatHub to some degree. That That's a small part of the problem. Distribution is not the problem. I, I know monetization is, is a bit of a problem. I think the big problem is frameworks, languages. I personally, I think a resurgence 
of mono or something new. It doesn't need to be C sharp. I th- I liked C sharp back then. I thought it was a good language. I still do. I thought mono was a great idea, and I was called an idiot by many people for thinking it was great. I'm going to stick my neck out here and say we need C sharp to be successful on Linux because the a very, very, very large chunk of applications for Windows are built in C sharp. Those application architectures are typically amenable to being ported to Linux quite easily if you have all the right things. In fact, the other day, I was looking up some stuff about .NET in, in preparation for this episode, and I found out about a wonderful toolkit that exists now called Avalonia. Brandon will make sure that it's in the show notes. Avalonia is an open source spiritual successor to the Windows Presentation Foundation, and it provides you a cross-platform experience that is modern, is sleek, and is easy. That is, it's phenomenal that it, that exists. Yeah, that was one of the goals of Mono. Right. right? Yeah, and, and uh, that's what I really liked about it. One of the applications, so it was a server-side application, which had a desktop component to it that Novell wrote called iFolder. It was Dropbox before Dropbox existed. Obviously, very few people heard about iFolder unless you worked on Open Enterprise Server from Novell. Anyway, the, it was a .NET application on the server side, and it was a .NET application on the um, desktop side. The, so the sync client was written in, in C Sharp. And it was the same code for Linux, for Mac, and for Windows. Sound familiar? <laughs> sounds no like uh, sounds like Electron. Like that was the goal, and it was one of the. I I still have very fond memories of using iFolder and the other Mono applications that I ran on Mac and on Linux. I mean, it's really sad that it didn't take off. I do think that Linux, uh, the Linux desktop uh, landscape would look very different today if it would have. Things like Avalonia that can take the existing, now open source .NET framework, I don't need Mono anymore, would make things a lot easier to develop applications for, for every platform out there. It's so now that .NET is open, it's not, I think, I think it's all open. I don't. Yeah, they, the the most recent versions don't even call themselves .NET Core anymore. They're just the .NET framework again. Yeah, so .NET is .NET is purely open now, and in my opinion, there's no reason to not use it for. Even if if you decide even after all this that .NET's not your bag, or you're like you know you're, you want to do something else, another great toolkit that seems to be focused on this kind of problem space is Slint. Now it's written in Rust, but what I like about Slint is that Slint lets you use different programming languages. You are not required to write in Rust. You can write in Rust. You can write in C++. You can write in Node.js if you were insane. You can, and they provide a Visual Studio Code extension that integrates into it and provides you a higher quality experience for developing applications using Slint. And Slint is uh, full licensed and and it is GPLv3 for open so- for people to use with open source applications and there are a variety of options for commercial applications if that sounds familiar to you that's basically how Qt works today and that arrangement is probably one of the more sustainable choices that they could make because they made the whole thing open source but they made it in such a way that like if you're doing it for commercial applications that require Slint to be closed or your application to be totally closed, you take a very, it's a very small fee uh, to to do that. Or if you qualify for their ambassador program, it's apparently free anyway. So again, we'll make sure that there's a link to Slint in the in the show notes. The, the resurgence in creating cross-platform desktop application experiences encourages me. The improvements I've seen with the KDE platform, the the creation of Slint, the creation of Avalonia, and all of these things all generally tending towards, we want to make these native applications that fit well on the different platforms and look good and work well 
that is a very encouraging sentiment because this has always been the hard part for desktop Linux to succeed. I know people have talked about forever about delivery, about RPM versus dev, and distro fragmentation, and flat pack, and all this. Other. Delivery has been the easiest part about Linux. Delivery was the first problem we solved in, in Linux. Linux distributions exist because we needed a solution for the delivery problem for applications. What we don't have today is an application development story that commercial Linux distributions are endorsing and, and providing as a happy path. Once you have that, or even just the major community distributions, like if you saw Fedora promoting, say, KDevelop and GNOME Builder and Qt Creator, or if you saw OpenSUSE, you know, providing KDevelop or whatever, like if you start, started seeing those in place, I think you would start seeing more awareness about how it can be easy to make desktop applications. And again, the delivery part is easy. RPMs have been around for a while. There's a lot of examples of it out there. But even if you don't want to do RPMs, you have flat packs as well. And like, yeah, the delivery part has always been solved. And I think, it, a, I think a tool like OpenSUSE build service is one of those out there that helps make delivery as easy as it is. That's one of the goals of what OpenSUSE did with build service. Right. Yeah. You could take, for example, and I've done this when at, at a previous, at my previous job, I did this a lot where I wrote an RPM spec file for an application, sometimes a desktop application, a server application or a library or whatever, wrote an RPM spec file, and it would make RPMs and devs for Fedora, OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, CentOS, RHEL, SLE, Debian, and it would be fine. Everything worked. And that that's why I, like it frustrates me when we like home in on delivery as like a problem in Linux, because it's not. It really isn't. It's a distraction from the fact that we just haven't wanted to talk about the fact that developing applications on Linux is the part that we, we don't have. And we have all the tools. They're, they've been there all this whole time. We just don't promote them and we don't we don't put more effort into them. Like I've seen the snazzy stuff that GNOME Builder can do. And I've seen the slick way applications being quickly developed in KDevelop. There's no reason that these applications shouldn't be front and center as part of a Linux workstation experience that to encourage developers to build, to come into the Linux experience, love what they're seeing and love to make the next big thing. Thank you everyone for listening to the Suda show where business meets open source. We're a proud member of the Tux Digital Network. See you next time.